Things ready. No. Oh. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to mute everybody real quick here. Uh, mute all. Uh, and you can unmute if you have a question. Put up your hand uh, using the uh, button on your screen if you want to put your hand up to ask a question. And Kirk will keep an eye on that. If you see somebody with their hand up, when I break for questions, you will let us know. So I'm going to mute everybody and we'll get started. All right. Good evening. Those of you that don't know who I am, I am Lee, WA5LEE. I am uh, an underling of Mike Hardwick, who is our communications director for the MS150. And uh, I will be running the command post as the incident command post lead this year. Um, I'd like to welcome back all the old timers, uh, welcome in all the newcomers, and uh, a special thanks to those of you that stuck it out with us last year during the lovely race that uh, event that was not, but we did get some really good Brazilian food on Friday night. Hopefully we'll be able to repeat that performance this year. So I do have a lot of stuff to present. So I'm just going to dive right in here. As soon as I dismiss the uh, <laughs> reminder that there's a meeting tonight. So I am going to start sharing this. All right, we're gonna start out with some basic information. I have not scripted this, so just bear with me. It's my first time running through it this year. I'm gonna start with the location of the command post, which is at, which is obviously not, oh, there it goes. Um, it is at 110 North Main Street in Bryan, Texas. We will send that out as a link to everybody. If you do not know where it is, please feel free to contact us. We'll give you the directions for GPS. Parking is a bit of an issue there during the day, but most of us will be coming in at 4.30 in the morning. Some of the overnight people uh, will be coming a little later in the day. It shouldn't be a problem. Uh, we are still up in the air as far as our access is concerned. Last year, since it was a one-day event, we did not have badges to get into the building and we were under COVID lockdown. So once we hear from Leslie and he decides what we're gonna do, since we're gonna be there 24 hours, uh, I'm kind of hoping they'll be able to give at least two or three of us uh, badges to get into the building. Because as it stands now, if you go outside to your car or you go out to lunch, you come back, you have to make dial an 800 number and they have to walk upstairs to let you in the building. So I don't know what the status is about that. As we get closer, we will know. Uh, COVID-19, uh, once again, it's not an issue this year. If you're symptomatic, if you've had contact with a person who's carrying the plague, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As they always say, please use your discretion and do not come. Uh, you can wear a mask if you choose to. That's fully your prerogative. In the EOC, there's a full kitchen. There are bathrooms and there are beds available if you want to coop for a few hours. I know we have hotel rooms for most of the non-local people. Some people may be doubling. Some people may be hot bunking <clears throat> with people that are working night shift to catch a few hours of sleep between shifts. What would you like to bring with you? Do not bring your car with 80 antennas on it, but if you have a special diet, if you uh, particularly like a snack, like uh, squid balls, if you have medications, special food, please bring it with you. There are plenty of industrial refrigerators available. Food will be provided both by Mike Hardwick and Cadence and uh, me. Uh, we'll be bringing breakfast, lunch, and dinner for all the shifts. And there is a, actually there's an industrial coffee machine on site, but it wasn't working. So we will work that out as well with half and half and sugar. Cell phones work well underground. If you have a laptop or tablet, please bring it. Uh, update it, make sure that it has Google Chrome on it because that's what works with our online logging program the best. And we'll get to that uh, account info for Chrome soon enough. We will be providing radios for everybody since we are underground. I would suggest, uh, I know Kirk is going to bring his Anytone. If another person or two can bring a portable Anytone or whatever, a TYT, with the national calling simplex frequency on it, I will be monitoring that from one room. If you guys need to speak to me from the radio room, you can just talk on the simplex channel and I will be monitoring that on scan for my radio in the big room. Please wear some form of name tag. If you have an uh, Aries badge, keep it simple. First name, close signs enough. And uh, we'll be giving some special 
prizes to the, uh, the regular team that is going to be working the radios. That's, you will find that out on Friday. Dress comfortably. Please do not wear fluorescent vests, body armors, um, hats. Do not look like N5 TCB and put a propeller on top of your hat is not necessary. We're going to be there for approximately 56 hours start to finish. You can wear sweats or shorts, just look presentable. We will also be providing a t-shirt at the command post that was provided by the MS Society. I'm not sure who picked them up. I think it was Keith Klimple, and I'm sure he will be bringing them with him. If we have them in your size, you are welcome to one. Preparing, if you have a Google account and we'll be logging, um, I believe just about all of you that are logging, I already have your Google accounts. So when I, I know I can give the log uh, access to you guys, make sure your devices are updated. Um, familiarize yourself with your assignment responsibilities, which we'll go over. Take a look at the uh, course maps to better understand who will be calling us and from where. And the, uh, the ride map is um, something we will discuss at length. Uh, if you guys would like to, you don't have to actually mark down, you don't have to write down that URL there, but I'm going to put that in chat towards the end of the meeting. I recommend very strongly that everybody bookmark that on their phones, their tablets, their computers. Um, in Google Chrome, it's the best browser to use, but you can use Firefox, Safari, whatever. Uh, that is going to be the main map that handles all of our operations, and we'll get into that towards the end of the meeting. If you are at the command post, please turn APERS off if you have your radio on. Uh, obviously, you're in the same room with us. We're going to know where you are, and it clutters up the map. Uh, this is from last year, leave preconceptions and egos at home. We are here as a subset of MS and the uh, victims of multiple sclerosis, as well as Cadence. For those of you that don't know Cadence, that is the private company that does logistics for the MS. They handle many events throughout the country, and uh, they basically will be the incident command um, at the command post and for the event. So let's go over the workflow of how we're gonna be handling the different information that we receive. We will be getting information from many different sources. There is a hotline for hands and officials at the command post. There is a rider assistance 800 number, which goes to the Cadence people. That's Roger Mast, uh, who is the owner of Cadence. He will be at the command post and Will Rubb, who is the race director from MS. They will be in the command post. They will be handling the biker calls we will be getting information from the ham net, the TexWarn P25 nets, of which there are four, as well as approximately 400 commercial radios, which will be handed out. Uh, we changed it from last year. Last year, there was one repeater and 15 simplex channels this year. There are six repeaters, most of which will be, well, four, at least four of which will be at the overnight, which will be deployed by, um, several people that are in this meeting, you know who you are. Um, all pertinent control panel on control panel, command post traffic should be logged in your respective log. We will have several logs, including one master log that's accessible to everybody. And we can all work on it at the same time. Josh and his partner for the overnight <coughs> will be running the medical net. They will have a separate med log, which will be accessible to med one, John Tiemann and his partner from the Austin side. So they will be able to uh, see the medical incidents as well as the cages people, because they obviously want to keep an eye on the safety and health and welfare of the riders. Um, anything pertinent should be logged. The, the expression goes, if you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. Uh, everything from the initial check-ins until everybody goes home. You can use your discretion. Um, I have, put a lot of thought into who the team will be. And I have very selectively chosen you because you are the best of the best. Uh, I'm not worried that you're not gonna be able to do the job. I think that you'll do an exemplary job. So a lot of this isn't necessarily pertaining to you. I know you're gonna do a good job, but I have to state it anyway. So uh, messages can be passed through the phone extensions or post-it notes for a runner. We still do not know how many people we're going to have as runners. Several people have signed up. I've been unable to reach them. Hey, um, Lee. Yes, sir. We have a hand. Jeff. We have a hand from Mr. Mr. Jeff. Go ahead, sir. So let's go back to the um, volunteer t-shirts deal. 
Um, so you're saying that Keith Klimple is picking up shirts for everybody in your, under your command? I believe he did already. All right. So if he did that, what do I do with all these shirts that are sitting in my uh, in my living room? See that box right behind my head? Uh, I don't even know where you are on the screen here. Yes. Right in front of your TV. Yep. I see he has a big box of a bunch of shirts in it. I, I was I was advised that when you had your meeting at uh, not at Transtar, but the school. Yeah. Yeah. You handed him the, the uh, command post shirts. So you may have given him a subset thereof. Oh, so so what you're saying is he may have picked he may have leafed through there and picked up the ones. OK, I got you. So I don't, I don't know how many he has and I don't believe he's here. OK. So I will I will check with him and make sure that you guys are on the same page. OK, because um, I have uh, you have more volunteers now than you did when that meeting occurred. Yes. And so uh, I have extra shirts. And of course, I give all extras to Hardwick on uh, Saturday morning uh, at the park and ride. Cool. All right. Um, thank you. No problem. Just, thank you, sir. And I just left the MS office and Melissa keeps telling me that I have shirts there. I'm sure you do. Uh, the, my, so did she say that you had uh, support shirts? Um, no, she, we did not volunteer shirts. She just said shirts. We didn't go any further than that. Okay. Did you pick up your steering committee shirt? I picked up nothing. Oh, well, that's the shirt <laughs> she's talking about. I only picked up the I'm not knowing. <laughs> I picked up the trackers and I'll go back there tomorrow. Okay. Well, my, Mike already got a custom embroidered shirt from me, which he probably won't wear. But I, I made up a special shirt for him, as well as, uh, like I said, special presents that will be distributed on Friday morning. Uh, my goal in this, and I'm not going to go much further on this at the moment, uh, but Saturday morning, we're going to walk in there like a professional team. We're going to operate and look and, and act like a professional team. And uh, we're going to we're going to raise some eyebrows. That's all I'm going to say for now. Anyway, so covering the workflow, this is obviously the first time that we have done the race in this configuration. We've planned for it for three years. Unfortunately, COVID and uh, we had a one one year one year we had a one day event that didn't happen because of rain. So this year, although we have had dual day races before, it's generally been from Houston to Austin with an overnight Lagrange. This is the first time we're actually going to be pulling the trigger on a two day three route race. So as far as the workflow is concerned, a lot of this stuff is going to be fluid. Once again, I'm sure everybody that I have picked for the for these spots. Is going to be way easy to handle it. You will know what to do. So the, as I said, the phone line will be coming in um, from two different phones. And there's also a medical hotline, which I'm not familiar with how that works. So I'm not going to comment on it. So I'm going to give some examples of how things should work in, in a perfect world. The command post hotline gets a call from a rider uh, marshal or a, a motorcycle marshal that a rider crashed and broke his knee at mile marker 54.6 miles to go on the Houston route. And we'll get into how we designate miles to go and, and uh, locations a little bit later on. Uh, the phone operator will either transfer the call to, directly to Josh or uh, Jacob, who's working the overnight on medical, or physically will go to the radio room and speak to Josh or Jacob day or night. And he will contact Med One and carry it from there. And he will also log the incident. It will then be given to, uh, he will also, Josh will also put some markers on the map, which we can discuss a little bit later. If you transfer it to, uh, to the medical op, uh, he will obviously, as I said, contact Tiemann for guidance and handle it. If the Hotline gets a call from uh, the, the rest stop three in Houston stating they need more toilet paper. There's a change of workflow this year. We are going to have supply one on the trunk network. And I believe Mike, you had said, correct me if I'm wrong, we're gonna put supply one on the SAG. Yes. Okay. So I'm, at least that's what I'm gonna to try to do. That's the plan. Yeah, that's the plan. Now oh, supply one. Sorry. Uh, just to let you know, in the past, um, we've had a supply person 
at the command post. Um, right now, we don't have anybody designated for that. And not, not a ham, but an actual supply person. Right. So um, this way, if, if they're on their trunking network, we can at least get a hold of supply one to, to get things taken care of a little bit faster. To get the ball rolling. Yes. Okay, so that's how we're going to handle uh, we're running out of water at rest stop three or we need toilet paper, rest stop four, et cetera, et cetera. We will be contacting supply one is the logistics handler, whoever that may be. As I said, it's going to be a fluid, ever-changing situation. We have no idea how to get things done, but that's what we do as hams. Uh, you can pass information through the phones or post it note or a runner. As I said earlier, we're still not sure what the phone situation is going to be. I'll show you some slides of what we had for the one day, whether those extensions are going to be the same or not, or we're going to have phones in the radio room or not. Is still a Hail Mary at this point. Uh, as far as your own personal documentation, I recommend that everybody keep a personal ICS-214. Uh, anything that, once again, if you don't write it down, you didn't do it. If anything happens uh, of, of significance when you show up, when you leave, et cetera, et cetera, write it down. It is, it is good practice if we do have any type of an incident in the future and you participate in MCOM or OXCOM work with areas or deployments with emergency services, it's a good thing to have and always keep a copy. Take a picture of it before you hand it in to Mike or myself at the end of the event. Now, what happens when the poop hits the fan? Hey, hey Lee. Yes, Mike. Go back one, go back to the next slide. On the phone extensions and stuff like that, uh, the phone lines that were just tested today to make sure that the command post 800 number works, mm -hmm. medical 800 number works, and the rider uh, support rider helpline works. All those were checked today. They all work. Okay. Um, the way they will work is the rider hotline goes to one phone and one phone only. Okay. Well, just and like that, here. And that'll and be Roger, correct? That'll be Roger. Good. The, the command post number will go to one phone. If nobody answers, it'll roll to a net, another number. Perfect. Another extension. Uh, as I said earlier, we still don't know how many phone operators we're going to have. Hopefully, we'll have at least one or two per shift. One or um, two. And, and then on medical, it'll be the same thing. Now, medical, uh, we may have that go to Josh, whoever is handling the uh, medical P25. Right. So what's, what's that way, if, if it rolls over, if he doesn't answer it, if he's in there sleeping, They'll roll over to you or to somebody else. Huh. If he's in there sleeping, Sean can poke him or John can throw a piece of paper at his head. <laughs> um, what I'm more concerned with is how we're going to have phones outside in the main room and be able to transfer calls to the radio room. Because last year, I think we had one phone in there and Leslie said we'd be able to have more phones, but they never appeared because we didn't actually run the event. I, I made the note. I'm going to talk to Leslie tomorrow about it. Outstanding. Thank you. All right. Uh, preparing for the unpreparable. If an emergency mass casualty incident or when the uh, Shinola hits the fan, uh, if you receive emergency traffic, whether it is on the telephone, the ham radio, the P25 network, clear your net because nothing is more important of an, of an emergency. Have all stations stand by, hold everything that's not of emergent nature. Notify the command post personnel that need to know about it, whether it's the medical people, the, the law net. If we do have a law enforcement officer there, it's we don't know about that or not. Notify me, notify Mike Hardwick. Make sure that the message gets out. If it is a mass casualty incident of significance, besides like one person with a minor or, or even a major injury, we're gonna operate under a tactical secondary net and I will probably jump in and dispatch that um, to try to, uh, with the uh, 205 and the mutual aid and get everything tied together on that so we can continue the event operations separately without having to worry about that. When the emergency is resolved or passed, announce that the net is now open and take care of whatever traffic is being held. As I said, emergency traffic always takes priority and safety of the riders 
and the personnel operating it are the most important thing. Keep uh, communications clear and brief. Um, those of you, like I said, that are working the radios have done this for a long time. Uh, Riley Hollingsworth is not hanging out in the, in the command post. So if somebody misses their hand call sign in the middle of an emergency, don't worry about it. Do not sweat it. And uh, I even put a sorry, Riley, in there. Um, don't worry about ham call signs. I know that's, a, that's antithetical to everything we teach people, but if there is an emergency, I, I and Cadence and MS and the public at large are not terribly worried about getting your FCC call sign out there every 10 seconds. Take care of what needs to be taken care of and make sure you log everything. Enough about that. Anyway, going on to Brian. Uh, I only have the diagrams from last year in COVID. So I don't know how the tables, chairs, and equipment is going to be set up this year. So I'll just go over what we had last year. We are in a bunker, as they say. And uh, this is what the main room looked like last year. Looking from the back to the front, bottom to top, we have two large screen projectors in the front. One is going to be showing our map, which we will cover later. Our map, which is different from the map that Cadence uses. They can uh, pr project that on their laptops if they wish. Ours has a lot more concise and a lot more information. On the second projector, we will probably have weather. If there's any possibility of weather, well, we can also put other information on that. There are also four pillars throughout the room with smaller screens that I can direct different information. We can always put the master log on one, et cetera, et cetera, or weather on one of the small ones. There were several tables, the lower left-hand corner having four, four telephone extensions. That's the uh, ham radio hotline uh, for a non-public and non-rider. And we had four lines there. The upper left-hand table was supposed to have people and we never did. The lower right-hand corner table did not. The center table so is- Lee, Yes, Mike? I believe this year we're the lower left-hand is gonna be moved over to the lower right-hand. Okay. I believe we, we will all be extremely excited to see it on Friday morning when we walk in there and there's no tables in the room at all. That's right. <laughs> the center table is, uh, I, I don't know why medical is there. That 1031 extension should be in the radio room. Uh, so we, we did not have that available to us last year. So there was a medical person answering the phone and running in anything. Well, it was supposed to work this way. Uh, the logistics person, the supply, was on 1024. They were not there last year either. And then we have the two rider support positions, which are, were held last year by Roger and um, what's Roger's partner, Gary? Gary was never there. No, both of them were there last year. Oh, I never saw Gary. Yeah, he was in, he was in and out. Okay. But Roger and his partner, Gary, were both there uh, at some point. And this year we have Roger and Will Rubb. Will Rubb is the MS race director. And I believe this is his first two day event as well. He's been there for approximately three years. So we're gonna do our best to impress him with, with our abilities and how helpful we are to this. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, the horizontal square is where the tech Leslie operates the uh, telephone patches and video feeds from. And that's my little desk there, 1040. Uh, hopefully I'll get the same extension. So if you remember how to, how to reach me, it's the IRS. You just file a 1040 on an extension and you can reach me. As I said, this is 21. I don't know what it's going to look like this year. Now the radio room. This is obviously not to scale, but the door is on the left-hand side, which opens from the main room on the right-hand side. Uh, immediately to your left, after you walk through that door last year, we had the medical trunk net that's... Uh, Josh and Jake's station, as well as the law radio, which we did not have manned. And going clockwise around the room, all the way to the right side, we have the uh, existing ham club that's Ron Hambrick's stuff uh, and his club, which we, I don't know if Ron's on the meeting or not, but if you are or you aren't, thank you. So, oh yeah, there you are, sir. Welcome. Um, and we appreciate your help this year. That's all of their equipment. They have weather stations and computers and all-star and all kinds of digital radio equipment that we're going to try not to break uh, or operate if we have if we have a choice uh, you, might, uh, <laughs> you might ask if ron has anything to say about 
any of the stuff there. Oh, I'm absolutely going to give Rob. I was actually going to call on him after I finish this slide to see what he wants to tell us about what has changed and what's different. Um, going around the room clockwise, we've got the, uh, the ham nets, which are going to be in that lower right-hand corner. We're still not sure how many we're going to have. I know on Sunday, we're going to have one, which goes from LaGrange to Austin. So there'll be a little less pressure on us and we can take turns logging and operating the radio and working the moving map, et cetera, et cetera. On Saturday, uh, we're still not sure if we're going to have one net or two nets, where they're going to be, et cetera, et cetera. But we will determine that very shortly. Continuing, we have the commercial VHF. It actually wasn't there. It was supposed to be there, but it was actually right by Ron Hambrick's radio equipment. We had the commercial there. And then we had the tactical trunk radio, which was standing by in case we needed it for an event, as well as the SAG. And the SAG is still in that corner. So that's where Luke is going to be sitting. Uh, everybody who is a radio operator uh, or ham, a commercial or trunked, but uh, not trunked, and if you have a headset with a mini mono or a stereo to mono adapter, please bring it with you. I've been uh, promised, assured by Keith Klimple, one of our tech specialists, that he will be able to attenuate the all-star radios that we were able to plug in last year that had issues with volume uh, in and out. He will be able to do that on the fly, make sure everybody's radio headset and push to talk work correctly. As always, in any uh, operation, try to keep the noise levels low. This year, with the uh, the grace of Mike and the uh, Harris, uh, the, the City of Houston Radio Department, we will now have headsets and push to talk buttons for all four P25 radios. So uh, Paul Owen is not working the Sagnet this year. He was a big fan of cranking the volume up to. 10 and making it very loud for everybody in that radio room. So you will all have your own little private uh, Motorola headset and a push to talk button. So it should be a little bit uh, less chaotic in there. As I said earlier, please bring a laptop and a power supply. Mike Hardwick has said that there will be, he will be bringing some external monitors. So you can uh, view the moving, the, the, the tracking map and or the log that you each individual be, will be responsible for. Real quick, I'm going to go over some of the channel plans. We have two out of three 205s taken care of. <clears throat> Technically, by uh, NIMS rules, they should all be on one 205, but it would be like 30 pages. So we broke it down a little bit. We have the commercial uh, 205 in front of you now. Uh, the SAG is, well, you can see under function, which are simplex, which are repeaters. Those stars are not lined up. Uh, they were lined up. So just move the stars down a quarter of an inch and you'll see the stars. All red stars are in LaGrange Fairgrounds. Those are the four repeaters that Mike and Steve and company will be setting up for the overnight. And the blue repeater, which is Kyle Operations coming out of Texas A&M, are the only repeaters. So there's five repeaters as opposed to one from last year. There are three receive only channels down at the bottom, uh, depending on what part of the route you're at. And uh, the simplex frequencies are only going to be used locally. We should not have to deal with any of those in the command post. Uh, the LaGrange repeaters will more than likely not be able to have to be dealt with at the command post either. The only repeater we're probably going to have to work with on uh, um, Sunday is the operations repeater and possibly some of the simplex channels, depending on how good the antenna is on the commercial radio at the command post. So I'm just going to ask Ron Hambrick to jump in right now. Uh, if you'd be so kind, sir and give us any insight you may have about what the layout is gonna be for this year and what you would suggest what's going on. Okay, can you hear me, Lee? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know, since last year is my first year and it didn't get pulled off, but uh, let me tell you, I do plan on being down there when you start to set up Friday morning. We do have, um, Friday evening, 9 uh, p.m. to 5 a.m. covered, and uh, hope to have two uh, hams there. And I have two hams on uh, Saturday evening, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And uh, we'll just see if we need any more uh, as uh, things go along. And uh, like I say, I'll be there the first thing Friday morning to, uh, uh, and then most of the time, probably in and out. Out. Outstanding. I wasn't 100% sure on Saturday 
Uh, you only had a couple of people sign up on the comms form. Uh, by the way, if there's anybody that's going to be working at the command post or at any event for that matter, any, any position, and you have not signed up in two places, please make sure you do that. Uh, you can go to the Texas MS150HAMS.org main site that Charlie hosts the sign up and there's explicit instructions on how to sign up. You have to sign up in two places. It, it is required. It is for liability purposes and for um, record keeping purposes. You have to be signed up in both spots. So those of you Lee, that have not done that. Uh, Lee, we're, we're I'll make to... sure, Lee, I'll make sure the guys uh, have gone out and done that and also myself. You're already in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're in there. Um, I don't have this, this sheet in front of me, but there's two other guys from your club. One of them is going to be, uh, uh, I believe Friday night. He didn't say about Saturday night. He said that he was supposed to be working medical backup or something, but um, I'm not quite sure. We could talk about that as we get closer. I'm not terribly worried about that. But I didn't Absolutely. very much, very much Absolutely. appreciate you guys helping us out. I'm sorry it took us so long to get with you. It's been, uh, you know, with, with COVID lifting and all the events we've been running, it's just been a crazy few months. So uh, I'm glad that you're on board and we appreciate you and your, and your crew. So thank you. Any, any idea what's going on with the radio room? We still looking the same as we looked last year, pretty much. Uh, yes. Uh, I talked to Leslie about uh, one of the um, plugs may have been up for uh, a telephone there. I know it's not, doesn't have internet connection and uh, anything you go through, Leslie, on that, uh, let me know. Other than that, the radio room hasn't changed. Okay. Uh, we will take out any eye gates that we have for Windlink there. So we have access to those outside antennas. Ah, beautiful. Um, if you do touch base with Leslie, tell him an ideal situation would be to have four telephones uh, in that room, one for medical, one for the tactical net or the law enforcement net, one for Luke and the SAGs, and one or two for the ham radio operators, just so we can transfer calls from the call desk or me to them and vice versa. So if you have any pull with him, that would be phenomenal. <laughs> so we need four uh, phones in that room and uh, how many internet connections? Um, well, I'm going to go under the assumption that we're going to have at least six computers in there. I, I remember they had Wi-Fi last year. I don't remember how tightly locked down it was because we obviously didn't have a chance to stress test it. So I don't True. know what their, what their firewall, what ports they're going to let through. We're not going to be using anything funky and out of the ordinary. All of our stuff, and, I'm, and, and once again, I'm going to defer to Steve, AG, and John about how the all-star stuff works. I'm not 100% sure how you guys link stuff. I'm assuming that there's some internet connectivity involved. But if there are any specific ports, um, you guys will be able to talk to Leslie. We didn't have a problem last year uh, with those ports being forwarded through Ethernet. Wi-Fi may be an entirely different story because um, we generally, uh, IT people, we lock down um, Ethernet uh, differently than we lock down Wi-Fi. But we, we will deal with that as time goes along. I won't, I won't bore the non-techies with the esoteric technical stuff. We will get it done. Uh, so to to cover your point, probably if possible, six uh, Cat5 connections or one and give us a, a six or eight port router, which we can provide if he just gives us an Ethernet cable in there. We can provide Cat5, Cat6 cabling on the fly and and, and provide a six, a six to eight or eight or 10 uh, port dumb hub and distribute that in the room whatever's easy okay all right thank you and i'll check on that outstanding and thank you again. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm calling leslie in the morning anyhow for some other stuff so i'll go over everything then okay if you can find out about access to that would be nice i think the access and this is i think um they may give us a card just kind of like a the bathroom key to, to where you can go out <laughs> So one card to where you can get in and out, that type thing, uh, I think, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll check. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Once again, here's the commercial net. Not a lot to go over. It doesn't really apply to us. Uh, it will apply to the commercial radios, which we'll be programming this coming Monday up at the uh, MS headquarters in Houston. Uh, when it comes to the 
those of you that are trunked fans, this is page one of six for the 205 for the P25 network uh, given to us most graciously by the city of Houston and worked on between Mike and uh, Tammy McGeehee, who have done a phenomenal job trying to get everybody to talk to each other. And I had no idea. I'm a P25 fan. And uh, I had no idea that there was this much patching involved. Uh, I just put this here as, as a demonstration of some of the complexity of this, but it's just, it's a phenomenally difficult job getting everybody to be able to talk to each other throughout the entire route. So that's just a, just a heads up that it's just amazingly complicated to get everybody on the same pitch with switches and gateways and console patches and hot wire patches. Anyway, uh, the ham nets, I have received several requests for this. Uh, Mike friends, the sad guy has been, uh, we do have a Winlink eye gate or tell that. All right, Ron. Thank you, sir. We'll let you know. Um, I have received several requests from people about the code plugs, which I will be making up once we get the, uh, the 205 ham nets uh, straightened out. There were some technical issues and we're not holding off out of neglect. We're holding off to make sure that it is 100%. So we don't have to give you an Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Foxtrot, Echo version on the last week. So once you get it, it will be good to go. And I promise we'll get it to you soon. Enough of that. All right, kept this from last year. We're gonna talk about logging real quick and I'll just breeze through this because it's pretty much self-explanatory. Um, please get a Google account. I believe most of the guys that I have on consoles this year do, but if anybody's on a radio this year, I know Luke does, so he's the new guy. Uh, we can, uh, I'm not even gonna read the first thing because everybody has Google. You don't have to send it to me because I know them. Uh, you will all have a shared log, which Kirk, N5XJB is going to be nailing down to make sure it has uh, the robustness. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. It has all the, uh, all the fields that we need and it all works together. We, we changed Rick Broussard's last year a little bit. We didn't really get to use it all that much because of the brevity of the event. But this year uh, we'll hopefully be able to use it a little bit better. There are yellow, yellow fields and gray fields. Most important thing to remember is you don't touch anything in the gray fields. The uh, gray fields are filled in automatically. If you didn't log it, you didn't do it, even if you did. And most importantly, there are HIPAA issues, which is the healthcare privacy law. Uh, when, you are, when you receive, pass, or otherwise transfer information regarding a rider, do not transmit or, or in any way disseminate the name of the person. We work with bib numbers only. If it is a pedestrian that is involved in some type of issue, it is a pedestrian. It is not the person's name. We can give generic information. In other words, approximately 50 year old male bib number block, but do not give any personal information over any um, publicly scannable uh, way. You can give information personally to Josh so he knows a little bit more. And there will also be private layers on the map where we can provide information, which we will uh, cover in the future. Anyway, enough about that. This is what the log looked like last year. It's a little bit changed, a little bit more uh, robust for this year. Basically under the VIA um, column, there is a pull down. You can choose how the call came in whether it was by telephone, Hamnet, hey, Mark, net. Mike Hardwick. Hey, give me a call. I saw your email. I wanted to. Uh... I muted him. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Um, you'll be able to pull that down and say how the call came in, whether it came over the Hamnet, the Sagnet, et cetera, et cetera. The caller, if it's a caller uh, name, if it's not a ham, put the name. If it's a ham, put the call sign. Then you hit tab twice. The time will automatically fill in. At that point, you put the issue. Um, and then you can just go to the next line. It will give you a record number automatically sequentially and give you the time that the record was first uh, entered and those fields will lock. Uh, anybody who resolves that particular issue can put the resolution in the resolve net. If it was the person who logged it, just put in, uh, it was resolved. Uh, we, we provided this message to so-and-so 
and it's done. When you hit tab, the last field will fill in with the last time the field was modified. Make sure once again that you're logging under your um, ID in Google so we know who logged everything. Because if you're all under the same ID, we obviously can't track who put in what. Enough of that. Anyway, assignments. I cannot promise anybody anything, but this is the way I have it laid out so far. We have a shortage of people this year, or we may have a plethora of people this year. But for the most part, this is how things are going to work. And the yellow fields are tactical call signs. Mike, our only Mr. Hardwick here, is going to be COM1. And he is the COM L, the leading COM L for the um, entire event. Uh, I am my tactical call is CP1. I'm going to be the incident incident management and uh, the incident command post manager. And I will be running any poop hits the fan tactical net uh, under ICS and NIMS. Josh, who is with us. Uh, Josh, I believe you're still a nurse, aren't you? Just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. Or if you're a doctor now or a surgeon or what? Yeah. Are you still a gynecologist or uh, do you have a different uh, medical title now? Uh, gynecologist? Yeah, no. <laughs> Gross. Mm -mm. In any case, he is going to be our uh, medical net operator during the day. And Jake, um, hoping he likes to be called Jake and not Jacob, he's going to be our night overnight medical. He is not a ham. He goes by Jacob. But... He goes by Jacob? Okay. Yeah. Um, he is not a ham. So um, he obviously will not be able to work any of the ham radios, but I, I, I wouldn't blame him if he didn't want to anyway. Um, Sean, the uh, emergency coordinator from Aries District 14 Northwest is going to be um, Saturday's Austin net controller, assuming we have a West and East net. And he will also be operating on the ham net on Sunday. Kirk and 5XJB is going to be in charge of the logging database. He's going to make sure everybody is... Uh, not having problems with all the numerous logs we use. He will also be able to spell uh, operators and help out with the information on the maps and the uh, logging, et cetera, et cetera, and take over shifts for the radio. Uh, Mr. John, KD5U, is going to be operating as well a ham net. He will also be in charge of the commercial radio on Sunday <coughs> to help out with that. And he will also be monitoring the tactical uh, trunk net in case anything comes in on that and we don't catch it. So sorry, John, I gave you three radios to listen to because I love you. Uh, Kevin, uh, who I do not know who he is. I don't know if he's here, but he was kind enough to say he'd be working Friday night on the ham net. And I wasn't sure. I know he's one of Ron's guys. Uh, so I don't know. If, did Ron, did you say Kevin is going to be there on Saturday as well for the overnight? Uh, no. Um, Paul um, is on the uh, conference tonight. He will be there Saturday night. And I have uh, a couple other that I'm looking at pairing with everyone. So it's going to be well covered. Outstanding. All right. Yes, I, I see from Kevin. Uh, he's going to be there Friday night only. And Kevin, thank you. Welcome to the, the, the crew. Uh, you were probably there last year too, but <laughs> I, I didn't meet you long enough to get to know you. So thanks again. So we do have the overnights covered. Uh, Luke, who's with us tonight, uh, if you don't know what Luke looks like and you're a Doobie Brothers fan, he is Michael McDonald. Uh, so he's not showing his picture, but uh, excellent uh, professional. He's a uh, district. Uh, he's an emergency coordinator for um, for District 1 down here in Arias in southern Texas. And he's going to be doing the SAG this year for the first time. Be gentle on him. He's been working very closely with Mike Friends, and he knows what they want. They know what he's going to be doing, so they should be good. And, of course, there's Mr. Ron, who is our ham liaison. He's going to be in and out. Uh, Keith, KD5, K5DKK, is going to be working all-star. His call is COM51. K5PTZ John is also with us tonight, and he's 52. And um, Mr. AG Steve, I wasn't sure if he was going to be on site, on the road, whatever. He is Don't also good. He'll be COM 50. Okay, so he'll be COM 50. I ran out of room on the page, but he is COM 50. Uh, others will be as needed. That's PRN, by the way, sorry. Um, operating the phones, logging, operating the maps, 
net relief, um, fetching coffee. We will all be participating together. No job is a small job. Um, and Roger Mast will be the incident commander and the public information officer. Uh, we will cover that also. He is the- Before you, yeah, before you go to the next page, uh, might want to review some of the questions in chat. Okay. We have hands. No, we, we have questions in chat. Oh, I don't have chat open. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, the first one, uh, Jeff said that he has at least uh, four people's shirts for the command post. Uh, John, Klein, Ramsey, Kaufman. <clears throat> okay, let me address that first. I have not heard from Joseph Klein, and my apologies to him if he is on this Zoom meeting. Um, I have sent him numerous notifications or emails and I've not heard back from him, so I'm still not sure if he's going to be joining us. I'm going to start playing phone tag this coming week. Uh, well, next week after my house guest leaves to try to track these people down. Um, we can get those shirts either on Monday uh, or we can hook up at some point or you can just give them to Hardwick. Uh, Charlie asked about an eye gate. Do they have the capability to run one there? And from what Ron sent, I do believe they do. Uh, I have no idea what a gate, an eye gate is. So Charlie, if you'd like to ask Ron directly what your question is, go right ahead. Hey Ron, um, just a, you mentioned when you were talking about the ready room at the, and Brian there, that um, at some point you mentioned eye gate. I'm just curious if you guys have ever run an eye gate there, uh, meaning an APRS eye gate out of that location before. Uh, we don't have enough antennas for APRS, uh, but uh, what we have is two vertical antennas, dual band, and we have a dual band Yagi up and a long okay. wire HF. So. If something wants to be put in, that's what we have to work with. Okay, uh, good side of information. Uh, continue on. <laughs> Thank you. What, what, once again, another field that is way beyond my level of comprehension. Uh, to me, an eye gate is something that Apple makes that keeps the dogs from running out of the yard. Let's see what else we have. Kevin is here. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, any other questions before I move on? Real quick. Okay. Anyway, get back to the map. So we've got the uh, assignments. Obviously, there's going to be more people there. And as they as they come in, we will figure out what you'll be doing. And we'll all be working together as a team. All right, hours of operation and uh, duties. We will be staffed and operational from noon Friday. That is as per Mike Hardwick. Once we get everything set up, we will be manning the telephone. Uh, the cadence people may or may not be doing the bike line i'm assuming not because there's really no bikers until saturday morning but we will be manning a uh, a telephone in the command post from friday on in case anybody gets lost uh can't find a position needs general support etc cetera, etc cetera. that'll be on the cp hotline and the night shift will basically take over at 6 p.m for a briefing from the day shift we shouldn't have much to tell you other than to tell you how everything works uh and you will operate until 4 30 a.m on saturday uh, answering the telephone, and then you will get rest, uh, those of you that are coming back on Saturday evening. Saturday morning, the day shift will be there at 4.30 in the morning for a briefing and begin operations at uh, as soon as the briefing is done from the night shift. Uh, the, the CP hotline will be dealing with lost hams, and believe me, there will be a lot of them. I'm sure Sherry will be calling uh, at some point because she's famous for calling and not being able to find her spot, and I love Sherry to death. Uh, so uh, make sure you say I, I said hello. There may be some medical calls in the morning as people arrive to their positions. Hopefully not. Uh, logistics issues as the rest stops begin to open. There's inevitably one or two places that didn't get their tent or their uh, tent poles and all the other dips and doodles that all of the rest stops and lunch stops and break, place, break points did not get or signs that were not there. You may be getting telephone calls from people that have ridden the route such as Daryl, who's gonna be our scooter, uh, our, our, uh, our, uh, our uh, course uh, observer. He's gonna be flying up and down. And uh, if he sees a giant pothole in the middle of one of our routes, he's gonna be calling that in. 
Uh, yeah, he's the route. Know. He's the route scout. Route scout. There you go. Um, I like Scooter, but you've got that assigned to the other Scooter team. So, okay, Route Scout, Daryl. Uh, and then the night shift, once again, will show up at 6 p.m. We'll get a briefing from the day shift. I'm using that as a guide. I'm not 100% sure, and I know Jeff can uh, give me <laughs> – he was just standing up. He sat back down again. Sorry. Can give me a better idea of the exact times on Charlie as far as when we shut down the majority of operations – and get everybody to bed or at least at the campgrounds on uh, Saturday night. So if you want to just give me a better idea. So the, uh, the route closure at uh, rest stop seven will begin at about 5.15 to 5.30. Uh, that way we can try and have everyone across the finish line, uh, all assets included uh, by 6.30. Um, there will not be a hard shutdown for the route at any point until they reach Nelsonville. And Nelsonville will have a, uh, this, this uh, rest stop closes at whatever the time is. And it'll be posted. And if you're still there, you're gonna get SAG to catch up. Uh, and then that, that's at uh, rest stop number four, and then five, and then six, and then seven. But the 5.30 to 5.45, or 5.15 to 5.30 is the key uh, the key time where everything starts to pick up speed to go towards the end. And I would say that uh, the command post would be done somewhere between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, sir. You, you, can go, uh, you can go. You can get up now. Go get your okay. uh, snack. Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to do chores today because I don't have to work tomorrow. Ah, nice. Chores on. Chores on. Uh, okay, so I made a good guess. About 6.30, thereabouts, uh, we'll be able to hand over to the night shift. Uh, there is, as, as I'm sure all of you know, two location for campgrounds. Uh, they're pro probably calling them out wrong, but I believe one is St. Mark's to the north, and one is Fayette County Fairgrounds to the south, where the town of approximately 50,000 people gets an all of a sudden additional 7,500 people. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have, <clears throat> we'll be deploying repeaters there. And if I'm not mistaken, Pete Bighorse will be one of the coordinators there for radio and, and holding everything together and operating the nets. He will be a point of contact to call us at the command post should we have to, um, you know, help out in any way, shape, or form. They, they from historically do an excellent job of being self sufficient. However, uh, Saturday night into Sunday, we, if we at all possible, we'd like to have an extra couple people overnight just to handle if anything happens. Uh, on Sunday, obviously, there's only one major uh, route south to north, although there are two start spots uh, out of LaGrange, which was smart because you've got 6,000 and odd people leaving at all at once to put them all on one smaller county road uh, would have been... Um, not the best idea. So they split the start on day two into two routes, which we'll cover when we get to the map. Um, once again, 4.30 a.m. for the relief briefing from the overnight operators. It will continue until everything shuts down. I'm not sure to what extent we're gonna follow uh, demobilization of hams. We're gonna play it by ear. Uh, we wanna make sure everybody gets well, we want to make sure everybody gets released, first of all, because there are some dedicated people that will sit at a rest stop until uh, Tuesday, until we tell them that they can go home. So we want to make sure that all of our rest stops and our personnel are safe and secure. Uh, now, during the overnight shifts, I will be monitoring the tactical trunk net from wherever I happen to be, whether it's in the restaurant or the hotel room uh or at whatever meetings overnight i happen to get sucked into uh i will have my p25 radio with me and i will be on the trunk net uh the tactical trunk net if you need to reach me you can call me on that please do not call me and ask me how dinner was at three o'clock in the morning um but i will be listening to that at full volume throughout uh the overnight periods and immediately if any if anything happens or if there's any questions or issues that can't be handled. Um, I very much trust the overnight people, but uh, if there's anything you, you don't feel that you're 100% sure about, contact me and or Mike Hardwick and we will take care of what needs to be taken care of. Okay, problems, issues, and conflicts. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what I, just, I just heard a, 
a mnemonic, but I, I'll try to remember it as I'm talking. I am the target. Uh, I was the target last year. I should have been the target two years ago, three years ago. My job is to take the pressure off of the communications team in the radio room. Uh, I will deal with the Cadence people and the MS people who always want everything yesterday. Uh, do not allow, do not get flustered if any of them approach you. Make sure you pass it to me and I and or Mike will do uh, what is necessary to satisfy their needs. They will say, well, we need a SAG here. Why isn't the SAG there? The person's been waiting for 15 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. We will take care of it. Overnight operators, once again, do not hesitate to call me and or Mike with issues. Uh, telephone numbers will be listed in the command post on a piece of paper, as well as myself on the tactical net. Uh, please do not release or allow to self-release any rest stop aid stations or hams without approval. And approval will um, only come from the leads of the particular rest stops and or race personnel along the route. If the station, if there's an emergency and a station needs to leave, if the station is important, not saying that not everybody is important, but there are some people that are more important than others, please let us know so we can try to arrange coverage and I'll contact Jeff Walter and see if there's a substitute that can be uh, filling in those spots. Uh, significant events, there is a texting system that Cadence has uh, gotten um, operational. In the past, uh, we have done it. They are going to be doing it. Um, we may wind up doing it, I'm not sure, but we need to notify certain groups of text recipients if incidents such as a medical event, uh, God forbid, an MCI, a uh, tactical situation, if we have a shutdown of a breakpoint or a breakdown of a SAG, we basically need to notify uh, certain people on the text. Let me or Mike or the Cadence people know. If there are issues with the linking of the all-star ham nets, uh, you'll be able to deal with Keith. Uh, Keith Limple is going to be at the command post. Mike and John, once again, will be in different places and reachable. Uh, very important if, uh, in, in all honesty, the press and the media should not have the telephone number to the command post. If they get anyone, it will be the rider support line. However, some of them are very diligent and they may in fact get the command post telephone number. If anybody receives a call from the press or media requesting information, do not under any circumstances give information and pass it on to Roger Mast and the Cadence uh, operators. That's what they're there for. All right, real quick, task book sign-offs. Many of you are working on a uh, task book, whether it's through ARIES or through uh, FEMA or Texas Department of Emergency Management, whether it's OPSCOM, radio operator, COMT, COMEL. If you are assigned during a particular period of operation, which is a 12 hour shift for that position, you can get your task book signed off at the end of the bike, at the end of the event by myself and or Mike. And uh, you can also only get one, one position signed off per operational period as per TDEM rules. You can't be a COMT and a COMEL, both signed off on the same period. Uh, ARIES task books, I believe Ron Hambrick uh, has, if not the ability, the influence with Brazos County's uh, ARIES people. So if you're from uh, the Brazos County area and you need something in your task book for ARIES signed off on, you can speak to Ron. If he can't do it, he will hook you up. And anybody from Harris County or thereabouts can speak to me, anybody from Fort Bend can speak to Luke. We can, uh, we can take care of your area stuff. Take some time prior to the event, take a look at your task books. And if there's a particular task you wish to get signed off and especially Boxcom people, because we can pretty much do your entire book in one weekend on a couple of 12 hour shifts. Um, make sure you have hard copies of your task book available. And if you put a post-it note, I found this to be very helpful next to the task you wish to get signed off on. It makes it very easy for us to know what you want, uh, what you've done, and we will do the evaluations and get that done. Anyway, so that is the first part of this. Um, I'm going to briefly do questions. And uh, once again, I, I believe very strongly in the team this year. I think we're going to do an excellent job and very much, if not impress them, at least we'll be impressive to ourselves. And uh, we are professional volunteers. 
And that's how that's the face we're going to show. Uh, and I want to thank you, everybody for being part of this uh, brief question and answer period. If anybody has any questions thus far. Lee, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Mr. John. So it appears that the, the ham nets are somewhat fluid uh, and, and being worked on at this point. Um, do you still think we're going to have two uh, nets on Saturday, or does it look like we're going to have just one covering Austin to, to Houston? That is a question that I'm going to direct to Steve, John Cordray, and Mike. So, Mike, why don't you take the lead? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mike, if you take the lead on answering that and uh, refer to John and or Steve as necessary. I'm real easy. I'm going to do whatever Steve ZUA says. Two nets. ZUA says two nets. Okay, well, good. Um, and do we have any gaps in the net? Um, I guess we can, have, we can direct those questions later to those guys. But it'd be good to know if we have any uh, coverage gaps in those nets. There'll probably be some gaps. Steve's saying no, but there's always some dead spots along the whole course. Um, that's why there's some technical standards. And uh, since day one, it's 25 watts of power, some type of gain antenna. Don't use a 19 inch whip and say it's gain. Um, you know, obviously more power is better. A gain antenna, normally it's like 34 inches. Um, don't expect to work the event with a Bofang. Sure. Uh, like so many people do. Now, one thing to remember, you're going to hear the motorcycle team out there trying to work the event with the, the Bofangs. They're not going to get in. They're going to be screaming. They're going to be, you know, barely getting in. But they've been, they've been told over the years, you got to have something that may, works. Uh, a bowfang does not work. Um, so does that help out a little bit, John? Sure, it sure does. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, as far as the bikers are concerned, uh, none of them sign up and they all show up. So bikers being rebellious by nature sometimes don't like to necessarily follow the rules, but they have historically done an excellent job. They can always use their telephones to call the command post if something happens. And since they're very, very fluid and all over the course, we will be getting calls from them for support. There is, uh, I just want to mention briefly, there is some question as how to SAGs and um, personnel on the course will be handling uh, medical issues. Uh, it has been stated on two sides of the fence, whether they are to call 911 directly or they are to call through the command post. Um, we are still trying to figure out how that's going to work. Um, I would recommend that we stick to the original plan, anybody who's not at the command post. And rather than call 911, because the whole goal is to not stress out the local. Um, to give you an example, say you've got a small town with two fire companies and two ambulances, and somebody calls 911 within their geofence requesting an ambulance. Well, they're not just getting an ambulance, they're getting a fire truck or two, and they're getting a whole bunch of volunteers in their private vehicles, and probably the police, the local police, and they all have to be on the course for that rider. So that kind of disrupts the local system, which is why we contract and pay for private ambulance services throughout the event. Um, once again, it's not something that's within our control. There are um, decisions that are going to be made at the highest level. But for now, we are saying that anything that is viewed on the course until I hear otherwise is to be called into the command post via telephone and or radio. Enough said about that. Now, anybody who's in this meeting that is not at the command post that does not want to go into the mapping because mapping is a big thing. And I'm going to be showing a lot of information, which uh, only certain people will be able to practice for the next week. If you don't want to stick around, you're welcome to take off. But I ask that everybody that's going to be in the command post stick around for this. It's a little bit tedious, but it's an incredible resource that a lot of people have not seen some of the new features. So I'm going to start covering those. First off, before I would you like jump to off into sure. that, uh, for all the new folks out there, and there may be a few, 
um, that's never worked this bike ride. Uh, the MS-150 is a very unique animal. And uh, to being this year, the first two-day ride, starting in two different locations, ending in uh, College Station, again, very unique. Uh, at the uh, height of its popular popularity, the MS-150 had 13,000 cyclists. A couple of the Mike Hardwick sayings, one, uh, it was uh, the most unique city in the United States. It was 60 miles long and nine feet wide. Um, the other one was, it's like a slow moving evacuation until Hurricane Rita hit and we found out the ride actually moves faster. And um, my, uh, my best one is, just remember, cyclists, for every mile they ride, they lose an IQ point and some start at zero. So we have lots of riders that get out there and they're, they have blinders on and it truly causes accidents and incidents that are just beyond belief. Um, I mean, over the years, we've had an ice truck get turned over. We've had Farmer Brown that got fed up of the riders using his fence as a place to take care of nature. And they came out with a shotgun shooting over their heads. Um, the ride is, is truly, truly a unique animal. And um, we'll probably be close between 5,500 and 6,000 riders, which is when the ride was comfortable in the past. Well, like I said, at 13,000, it is it's a monster that um, if we ever get back up there, um, you definitely learn how to start drinking. That's it for me. For now. <laughs> Can I make a quick comment? Sure. Just need to make sure that everybody remembers when they key up to wait two seconds for the links to all come up and to uh, avoid uh, quicking. Or chunking, you mean? Also, uh, Josh had his hand up. I did. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Josh. <laughs> uh, are we going to, so, you know, Fayette County, Bastrop County, Austin, Travis County all want to do their own EMS thing, don't want to play. Uh, I know Austin County doesn't usually care. Um, and I don't know about all these other, you know, new spots we're going to are we going to have a list of counties that want to do their own ems also we need uh last year the one call that we got uh, i had to call you know harris county sheriff's office it'd be really nice to have a list of all the psaps and their non-emergency phone numbers and then all the random little police departments and stuff and all their phone numbers handy that is a question better directed to John Tiemann and Trey. I have not received any information on how the EMS part of it runs. So mm -hmm. Mike, if you have anything on that, you'd be in a better place to answer or Charlie perhaps, or even Jeff. I'll check with Tiemann on the uh, medical stuff, Josh, since I know what you're talking about. Um, cool. And same thing for the PSAPs and the uh, the local departments. I can get that from, uh, part of it I can get from uh, uh, John Miller on the PDs. And uh, see if I can go from there. See if I can get a list from them. Um, just to let you know, Josh, things are so fluid up in the air, snafu'd. We still don't know if we're having a command vehicle brought in from Austin as you used to be in for years. Right. In LaGrange. Okay. So uh, they still don't know if that's going to happen or not. Because Janet's no longer there in LaGrange. Nothing's happening there. Uh, that's why I need to get with Tiemann. Um, when we were at the public safety or medical or whatever you want to call it meeting, a couple of weeks ago, 
there was lots of unanswered questions. That was one that I wanted to find out because normally we have somebody there, but nothing yet. The mash is changing. I mean, they finally they finally got a hold of uh, Cat Rack. Cat Rack was finally brought in at the last minute, and I don't know if Set Rack is going to be there. Set Rack may be there with her bus, uh, which would be fine, but I still need to get a ham at that location. Okay, cool. As long as we don't, well, I guess Janet's not there, so we don't really have to worry about too much. Well, the, the new person there. Is, are they worse? I'm not going to put any judgment on it, but the thing about it is he's, he, he's come from Houston Fire Department, probably, you know, maybe as a captain or something like that. Now he is emergency management coordinator. So he's still probably learning a lot. Of course, it's been a couple of years now since he's been there. I don't know. I, I don't yeah. have to work with him that much. We'll figure it out. I don't mind pissing people off. Doesn't matter. Not a problem. That's that's what I tell my therapist. That's why I'm still on the planet. I have lots of people to, to still piss off. And uh, that's why I appreciate you've got the same mindset as me. You speak truth to power, uh, as do I, which is why I can't for the life of me, nor have I been able to for the last three years, understand why Mike Hardwick asked me to take this job because uh, I'm supposed to be the buffer between the, uh, the politic end of it and the real life end of it. And I am certainly not a politically correct person when it comes to sticking up for ham radio operators and volunteers and anybody who takes advantage or denigrates my volunteers and my crew is not going to be poo-pooed. They're gonna, they're gonna receive a mouthful. So thanks Mike for throwing me under the bus. But anyway, back to being the target. Uh, we're gonna cover now the most incredible piece of technology that is yards and miles beyond anything that we have used in the past. Um, and first off, I want to say thank you to uh, Pete Belbin, who I don't believe is with us tonight. He's got the, uh, the uh, Woodlands Amateur Radio Club meeting tonight. He's the president. He puts in hundreds and hundreds of hours doing these maps for events. He does the Boston Marathon. He does California. Um, races and events. He does he's several MS uh, bike runs, including the, uh, the Vineyard uh, run, which is coming up. He just started working with that and he does all of it for free. There are um, probably 30,000 lines of custom code built into his system. Josh would really appreciate what, looking at uh, the back end of his, uh, his server um, it, it's, it's just incredible. So thanks to Peter. And uh, because of all the work Peter has done, this is what we have. This beautiful, beautiful tracking map. I have put the link in chat. I would once again recommend everybody on this call, whether you're at the command post or not, to copy that link and bookmark it, especially the command post operators. Put it on every... Uh, device that you will have with you during that day. Anybody who's out in the field with your phone or your iPad or your Google pad to be politically correct or any device you'll be using, put it on there. It is the most comprehensive and fact-filled uh, map with uh, resources that you will find for this race. Um, in any case, everybody um, we'll be receiving different levels of security. We've instituted multiple levels of visibility this year because there are certain assets that we do not want to be visible to the general public. As you can well imagine, uh, if we have the law enforcement and or ambulances uh, on the map for people to see what the locations are, a bad guy could ostensibly take advantage of that. So we have certain layers that are not available even though it shows you can select them, you won't be able to see them. Uh, everybody that's at the command post will be receiving a secure login to this map on their particular station. Uh, it will be the same one for everybody at the command post. Uh, Josh and the medical personnel team in, and Trey will be receiving a separate login themselves with a different higher level so they can see HIPAA 
um, related information that cannot be disseminated to the general public. There will only be four people with that login. Um, and we'll just get into the meat and potatoes of it. And I recommend to everybody, including the non-command post people to play with this map and look at it, look at the different layers. You will not be able to damage it and uh, you know, get used to how it works. So we'll start with the basics. You have a bunch of buttons on the left-hand side, starting with the LS. Actually, I could back up a little bit. The plus and minus are basically the scale of the map. It's the same as using your mouse wheel to scroll in and out. It just basically brings the map closer or further away. So starting with LS, that's your layer select button. Starting on the right-hand side, you'll see base layer. All base layer is, is how you want to display the map. There's a bunch of different ways to display it. Um, OSM dark is a dark background. It doesn't put a lot of emphasis on the actual streets because in the command post, we basically need to see the moving assets more than we need to see the individual roads. We don't need to have a satellite view, but some of you at command at uh, rest stops may want the satellite view, which would be Bing hybrid. And you can zoom all the way in and see a satellite view of the rest stops and uh, where the assets are at the rest stop for those of you big pinging apers or um, the SAGs that have the dog tags. And when I say dog tags, those are the WTS trackers. And there are some people that are being tracked using their phones, using TRACAR, T-R-A-C-C-A-R, if you've worked the Houston Marathon or the uh, Woodlands Marathon or the Ironman, you're probably already in the system. I was talking to Daryl about it last night. Um, so you will all be in this system at some point. Um, so that's what the base layer, it's your, basically your background view. The center column, which is your tracker, we'll get to a little bit later, but the left side is the important side to start with. Since we have two days, we can show or not show the day one events, which are the top course stops, distances, active uh, to Lagrange. And then on day two, we can hide day one and just show the uh, Lafayette to College Station with all of the uh, stops, distances, and the active route. There's also an overlay for radar, uh, which is next rad. And once again, another scale button so you can zoom in and out. Um, as far as the tracking information is concerned, we'll cover that a little bit separately. But the all trackers button should be checked if you want to track the resources that are available at your level of security. And uh, that's all I'm gonna say for now. Talking about distances, previously we would put distances as miles into the race. In other words, if the, if the I keep calling it a race and I apologize to everybody, I keep calling it a race. The event, bike run, um, fun run, whatever you wanna call it, I'm gonna call it a race. Um, we previously did distances from the start to the finish. So in other words, if the race was 100 miles and you were at mile marker 15, you were 15 miles into the race. This year, because we have four different starts and four different distances on day one and two different distances on day two, we have changed it to MTG. So when you see a number followed by MTG, that's how many miles to go from that point until the end of that segment. So if we were looking at day one, which is the, uh, the Houston triple and the Austin single going to LaGrange, it shows how many miles to go until Lafayette, which is the overnight. That makes it easier for everybody. It is also <coughs> scalable. If you're out in the full view, like I am on the screen right now, and you look at the map, you can see there's uh, 70 MTG on the Austin side, 60, 50, 40, 30. It's kind of hidden by the other icons. Um, but if you were to zoom in, the closer you zoom, the scale changes. It goes from 10 to five miles, to two miles, to one mile, to half mile, to a quarter mile. And the box, shows from Lake Somerville lunch. Uh, you can see it goes from 32.75 miles to go to 32.5 miles to go. So they're quarter mile increments. 
And anytime you hover over a point in the map, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see GPS coordinates um, that you can use for better location. Um, the idea behind this is if somebody calls in and is using this map and says, hey, I am at uh, such and such road on the course and we need a ambulance or we need a SAG or whatever, you can look detailed in, go in and see, hold on a second, where am I here? Huh, I don't know why that happened. Uh, you can scroll in and see approximately where they are on the course. In other words, uh, Houston at the 32.5 MTG mark. So that gives the resources that are responding to that location a better idea. And once again, you can hover anywhere on the course to get the GPR, GPS coordinates in the upper right hand corner. The next icon is the SS, which is station search. This is really neat because you can do a search throughout the entire course based on either a call sign or a resource. So in other words, if you wanted to know where every SAG was, you could type in SAG and it will give you a list of all the SAGs. And I'll demonstrate this towards the end of this. I'm gonna do a live demo, but you could basically click on SAG 21 and it will zoom in the map to SAG 21 and move the map to wherever SAG 21 happens to be. For the medical people and the resource management people, if we have a need, all you have to do is type in the word N-E-E-D and it will show you everything on the course that has a need, whether it be a logistical need, a medical need, a SAG need, or other type of need. Okay, so that's station search. You can also designate um, a resource to follow. So if you are at a rest stop and you wanna know where the turtle is, you can put in the information on the turtle and your map will stay and follow that turtle. So you know when the turtle's passing by your station, you can get ready to uh, demobilize, et cetera, et cetera. If it's a moving resource, you can, you can filter down to the moving by clicking the moving button in the right-hand side. Very, very strong information uh, for this. The need medics will not be available to the, uh, um, obviously will not be available to the general public. This is on the level of um, what Josh and the medical people will be able to see, but you'll be able to see um, other information on there. Next one, double question mark, that's where you log in. The people at the command post, you will all receive your credentials on Friday and Saturday morning to get into the map. And I recommend that everybody run a copy of the map. The SAG, uh, Luke, and whoever's working with Luke will probably be working harder than everybody else on this map because <clears throat> they will be receiving SAG pick up requests from all over the course and they will be entering in that information in that and we'll, we'll go over those details later on um and the medical people will be able to see certain resources so that's where you'd log in you put your user id and your uh, your password hit authentication and you will see all the different stuff pop up on the map that nobody else can see next is <clears throat> the question mark uh the uh, the hourglass that is a street search not terribly important to those in the field, but can be important to those of us in the command post. If somebody calls in looking for um, where they're at or where a particular incident is that's not on the course, if you zoom into the general area, as long as it's contained within your view and you type in, and this is unfortunately a, um, a part of the system we can't fix, it has to be spelled exactly. So if somebody says, hey, I'm on Caldwell Road, and you type in C-A-L-L-W-E-L-L, -L -L, it's not going to return anything from Caldwell. Uh, so you need to get the spelling of the resource that you're looking for, the road you're looking for, or the um, structure you're looking for, or whatever, exactly. Uh, so I typed in the word Caldwell, and in this view, I got several different things in Cald Cald uh, Caldwell on the list in several different counties. So when you zoom in and you type in a road name, it'll, it'll zoom directly to that when you click on it. Next button is a full screen toggle, pretty self-explanatory. You can do that with the browser itself on your screen. 
And then the KY is the key. Um, each one of the rest stops has an icon or a number of icons that denote the status of that particular rest stop, whether it is open, if, there, if there's no icon whatsoever, or at least no highlight over the little green house, the Monopoly house, it basically means we've never set a status for it and everything will be reset before this whole thing starts. But if it's a solid green, as you can see the Attics Park in the lower right-hand corner, the Houston start is green, it means it is open. If there's a red X, uh, as you can see all the way on the Austin side, I believe it's the, uh, the school has a red X, it's closed. That would be for after the, the turtle has gone by, we will uh, set the status to be closed. If it is open and ready for people, it will be a darker green circle. If it is not ready for whatever reason, if they do not have enough supplies, they are manned but do not have enough supplies, it will be a darker maroon. Um, if it is a sag forward, which I'm not 100% sure of exactly what that is, um, it will be blue. And if there is an issue, it will be flashing red and yellow uh, on the screen. There are some other icons that the medical people and the um, net control people will be able to see, which I'll cover a little later. Uh, and the RE button is something new that was just implemented last week. It's called resource switch. If you hit the RE button, you will get a basically a spreadsheet in, in front of you, depending on how many routes you have enabled. Obviously, this is the entire uh, event, so it kind of goes below the level of the screen. But on day one, you would get all the east and west stations. Uh, and you can see what the status is. And the three different statuses is three different numbers. SAG, MED, and we just recently changed it to activity. I don't know we're gonna use activity, but let's start from the left. Your status, once again, is what the key says, whether you're open, closed is an issue. SAG is how many people are at that rest stop waiting for a SAG. That will be something that Luke and whoever's working with Luke will be updating in real time. Once he hears from SAG 12 that they just arrived at um, East 2, there's one person waiting for SAG. They will call in, obviously, to Luke and say, hey, we just picked up one. Moving on to um, our next stop, Luke and or his logger will change that one on E2 to zero. And then it will reflect on the main map for the rest of the world to see. Uh, medical, whether we're going to be using that or not, I'm not sure. Um, that will be how many people are actually at medical at each rest stop. And that will be something that Josh and Jacob and uh, John Tiemann and Trey will be able to adjust if they need to. Not necessarily something that we need to be done because they'll be way on top of things. Activity is something that is done at a lot of marathons uh, where you have, um, for example, you contact the lead of uh, Busher Park, which is Austin three. And you say, okay, we need a two minute count. I know many of you that work the uh, Houston Marathon were asked to do this. They'll, they'll say, we need a two minute count from Austin three. The lead will stand by the road and count how many bikes go by in a two minute period. That is what activity is. It basically gives the cadence people and the command post an idea of how busy or how many people are still running through that particular station in anticipation of the turtle going through and shutting down the station. We may use it, we may not. It's available, so that's why it's there. All right, the upper right-hand corner, as I showed earlier, it has the, wherever your mouse happens to be hovering, it has the GPS coordinates, but there are also other pieces of information. There are active distance information. Right now in the, in the view, I have all three routes. In other words, east-west day one, west-east day one, and north-south day two. So obviously there is a lead and an end for each one of those three routes. Um, yes, there are three starts, and yes, there are two starts of day two. We consolidated it to the longest of all the routes for each segment. So Austin is 75 miles from Austin to LaGrange. So um, the Austin lead, the two numbers show how far in the lead is from the beginning and how many miles left until they get to the end. 
The Austin last, think of that as the turtle. They're at the zero mile marker and they have 75 miles to go until they end that segment. Same thing with the Houston lead and the Houston last, which is the turtle. And Sunday, uh, until they get to College Station at 82.6 miles. And that is very useful because you will be able to highlight, if you look at the, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, the active Houston, active Austin, you'll be able to see with a gray highlight, the actual active part of the course, where the lead is, where the turtle is, highlighted in gray, and that will obviously shrink or grow uh, as the riders progress through the race. So it's a useful idea, useful resource to see uh, what's going on. And that will all act, um, all change in real time as the resources move around. So that being said, it is now uh, live demo time. And uh, once again, please visit that URL and explore, play with it, look at the different views, look at the different um, layers, uh, obviously, there are not any active layers being tracked at the moment because uh, there are no active layers out on the screen. But when race day comes along, believe me, there will be uh, a plethora of things for you to be looking at. And uh, as I said, we're going to start doing live now. So I'm going to close this one and select this one. Drag to desktop, three to share. Okay. I'm kind of hoping you guys can see the live map on my screen. Just, uh, Teresa, give me a thumbs up if you can see my map. All right. This is the map. I, I am not logged in right now. I am in as a generic human being. So anybody who downloads that URL and puts it into their browser, this is what you will see. Uh, obviously, until race day, you'll be able to see all the rest stops, all the starting positions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you go to layer select, you can see I've got day one and day two. So let's shut down day two for a minute and day one. And you will just get a map. And once again, you can change it to high DPI, which gives you a lot of smaller roads when you lot when you scroll in. You can change it to the satellite. A uh, bunch of different views. I particularly like OSM dark, but it's at discretion of the person. So we'll concentrate on uh, day one. So to Lagrange, we're going to hit the word course. That gives us the three starts in the east, the one start in the west, and they both end at Lagrange. They're all four different colors or shades, three shades of green on the right, one shade of orange on the left. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip over stops for a second. I'm going to put in, I'm going to click distances. So looking from the three starts on the right and the one start on the left, you can see how they go from 70 on the left to zero. And on the right-hand side, 100 miles to go down to zero miles to go. And as you scroll in, you'll see it goes, we're going to concentrate on this 10 to 20. You'll see it goes to 15, 20 as we get closer. It goes to one mile increments or two mile increments. As we get closer, it goes to one mile. And then as we get even closer, we get to half mile and then to quarter mile. So it's basically how, how close you zoomed in. And if you go to the road view, you can basically see that you're at the quarter mile mark at the intersection of County Road 223 and 159. So that's how that works for distances, okay? Zoom out to a little wider view here. We'll concentrate on the beginning of the Houston three starts. The next view, the next uh, layer is gonna be your stops. I'm gonna get rid of distances so it doesn't clutter the map. These are your rest stops, okay? We have three starts in the Houston metro area. We have Attics Park, we have Katy, and we have Waller. If you were to use the hybrid map and you wanted to see what Four Seasons Park looks like, you can put that and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and it will give you a satellite view of Four Seasons Park. And you can use that to determine where the people are going to be and where the route starts, et cetera, et cetera. 
And uh, then the green line is to the left of that where the road and the route starts. That's why I keep it green uh, with a black background. It's easier to see. So that's our uh, Four Seasons Park location. And then, of course, there's the Waller ISD, and you can zoom in on that with satellite view as well. Then we start with rest stops. We start at the beginning, start to the end. Since we're going to have two nets, thank you, Steve, John, Mike. Um, the east net um, will be concentrating on one and two, as well as one K. We call that one K to differentiate it from the, uh, the Katy start. This is one K, which is Royal High School on the uh, energy corridor start. When they get to the spot here, there's a merge at this point where Katie and energy merge. And then spot three is obviously Mount Zion. And the Waller start and goes to one W. So that's how we differentiate the uh, rest stops in the beginning on the east. Once we get to Belleville, everybody goes to eat lunch and all three starts merge. Obviously, then we have four, five, six, and seven, which is Dolores's house. And then everybody finishes at the fairgrounds from Houston. Same thing, same old story, same old song and dance on the west route coming from Austin, which starts in front of the Capitol and lunches at the Baptist Church. And then there's spot three, spot four at the Medical Center and then Fayette County. The overnight at Fayette County, we can scroll all the way in here when everybody merges onto 77. This is the end of day one. Up to the right above Vets Drive is I believe St. Mark's campground area and then the Fayette County Fairground on the lower part of the map. That's uh, once again, a little bit out of our wheelhouse. Jeff probably knows every square inch of that, but we won't get into that. So that is day one. You also have the distances, as I said before, and you also have the active layer, as I spoke a little while ago, with the active gray line highlight, which shows how much is left to go what the active parts of the course are. Now, this will obviously change based on the position, uh, the, the tracked resource that's in the lead and the tracked resource that's the turtle. I have the ability to adjust it in case we lose tracking of the resources. I can, I can change where they are. I could designate anybody as the lead or anybody as the turtle if we have to do switching on the fly but that gray line will move along with the active part of the course. Turning off day one brings us to day two when you have the same information. You have two starts, different rest stops, and the active route. We've only done the, the Carmine route because uh, round top's pretty much the same distance, but it's just easier to do one. So that once again, the active route will follow the turtle and the lead. And uh, we have the, the two rest stops on each side for the two different starts on Sunday. 1C is the Carmine route. 1R is the round top. Same thing with 2C at the bank and Blue Hills on the round top. And they merge. And at about the uh, 60 miles to go mark. And from that point, they go to rest stop three. Lunch in Lake Somerville. Uh, hydration station four, that's a position that does not have full amenities, but has water. They may have port of sands there, I'm not sure. And then there's snook, which is five, which is the last rest stop before the finish line. That's 15 miles to go once they go to snook. Now, just uh, as an aside here, I'm just gonna zoom in to the um, satellite here. Cadence and MS have changed last couple of miles of the route. So if you've been following earlier maps, you may not see it. They have eliminated some of the routing around the actual city and they've, this is updated. So this is what the new route is gonna look like coming into the stadium. Many of you uh, that are on the road that are in this meeting, may wanna know how to get into the stadium. You go down Houston Street, you pass through a parking lot, go into a tunnel and come out 
on the field, which is where the finish line is. Okay, let's go back to dark again and zoom out. So tracking, when you have the all trackers button, and this is for the general public, when you have all trackers, this will give you every tracked resource that's on the map, whether it's an APRS pull sign or a, um, I think the motorcycles that are being tracked and the box trucks will be available for everybody to see. And that's pretty much it. Um, even though you can select uh, WTS, APRS, a lot of stuff is not gonna be visible to different people. Even though you can select it, it won't be. So let's go to the next level. And we're gonna put in, uh, Okay, so this is the second level of security where you will be able to see, let's just select all this stuff. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, if you hover over a rest stop as a non-authorized person, or you're basically getting against the name and the GPS coordinates, coordinates. If you hover over any of these rest stops as an authorized user at the command post level, you will see six lines of information. You'll see the status. You'll see how many people are waiting for SAG, how many people are at medical, and if we use the competitors. And if there are any issues, you'll see what the issue is. The general public will not see this information. If you have authorization to change the status of a rest stop and you click on the rest stop, you will then get a dialog that shows what the status is, because you can't change the status as a uh, non-high authorization. You can change how many people are waiting for SAG, how many people are at medic medical, and if there's an issue, you can say what the issue is. Um, so this is gonna be at a high level of security. You can also follow a resource by clicking on it. If you wanted to follow a particular motorcycle that's uh, following an active, and, and God forbid something like this happens, but worst case scenario, if somebody is driving through the course and hitting people. Uh, some lunatic decides to go on a, a rampage and we have a resource following it. You can uh, set that resource as your center and follow that vehicle, show the speed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once again, worst case scenario, uh, hopefully nothing like that will happen. So when you look at the particular issue, uh, the particular rest stop, you'll see three numbers under it if the uh, numbers are filled in. So let's say there's five people waiting for the SAG, there's two people at medical, and 22 people have come by that station in the last two minutes. <laughs> Once you close that window, you will now see three numbers under the rest stop. You'll see five, two, 22. First number is how many people are waiting for SAG. Second number is how many people are at medical. That's for uh, Timon and Josh and, and Jacob and Trey and the rest of them. And uh, if we do counts, they'll be the third number. Now, if you click at this level off course, your GPS coordinates will show up and you have three buttons available to you. Somebody calls in and says, let's change over to high DPI and, and zoom in a little bit and say that there's a motorcycle medic or a motorcycle operator who is driving past the 17 mile to go point on 2155 and he sees somebody off on private road 4019 that needs an ambulance, okay? When they call it into the command post, you're gonna get the exact location and you're gonna double click and she just needs a medic. At that point, you're gonna get the competitor's bib number. So let's call it 25, 2255, eight, and a chief complaint, whether it be uh, difficulty breathing, chest pain, twisted ankle, basic medical information that you don't need to be a paramedic, nurse, or doctor to figure out. And once you create it, the medical people will see a caduceus and a star of life show up on the screen with the bib number and what the issue is. This way that gives them a better idea of what resources are needed. And if they were to do a station search and type in or just click and type in NEED, that will give them a list of everybody on the course that needs something, whether it's a medic or a SAG. In this case, it's 22558 needs a medic, but 
if they're looking at the map and they see 289 needs a medic and it goes in order when they were entered, all they have to do is click on it and watch the magic happen. It will scroll the map to where the medic is needed. Obviously not this far off the course, but that gives you an idea. If there's a SAG needed at this particular location, the SAG people can click on it. My friends will have access to this. And if it's an off course needs a SAG, it'll be a blue, um, blue uh, star. And you can see that there's a SAG needed at that location. And if we need law enforcement, that will be available as well for PD with a star, uh, sheriff star. So that's one of the other bits of information that we can glean off of this map. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, let's get rid of this here. Okay, so let's zoom back out again and look at our layers. And we're going to go with the chorus, stops, et cetera, et cetera. So this is once again, Austin day one. Obviously that sag was from the first day, which is why you didn't see the course going alongside. But say for example, on the north south, day two, which starts here. So if we get rid of day one and we just had the two day, day two routes, if uh, there's a uh, person that needs a sag here on 1291, just to the east of Waldeck Church. Once again, you can double click competitor number uh, 25879 and just hit create. And a little blue star will show up that there's a person off course that needs a SAG. There's a person off course that needs an ambulance. There's a person off course that needs something else. Okay, anyway, now uh, stations. Once again, uh, if you're supposed to be able to change the status at this level, but for some reason you can't, so I'm just going to authorize myself. We'll change that before the race, but um, okay. So this is the level of authorization that basically shows all the goodies. Uh, if you are granted this level of authentication, you can see everything that is needed. The medical people will be getting this. <laughs> the sag that was left behind in Austin from day two. Uh, you'll be able to change all the statuses on the rest stops. So in other words, if uh, um, let's say station four on day two, the hydration station, you can see what their status is. They are not ready because there's nobody there yet. Once they get there, they will say that they are open. We can change it to open and their little green circle will change. When they call into the net that they are ready to accept customers, we can turn them green. If we say that, if they call it and say that they are sag forward, I don't know what that means, so I'm gonna skip it. If there's an issue, you hit the issue button and then you can put in what the issue is. Need beer. Okay, and then close. And then whoever hovers over that button at the medium level will see it's a flashing icon and the issue is they need beer. With the medical issues, they can hover over them and it will show them that you need a medic. It will not show the chief complaint because uh, we did not want that to show because people don't need to know that. That will be called in. That was a lot of people that need the medics. So obviously we've been playing with this all week. And then once again, you also have the leads um, and the, the course uh, beginning and end as well, as well as the three different numbers at each rest stop. Um, this, as I once again, I said that this will be uh, reset. Um, so if there's a resource on the course that you want to designate as the turtle or the lead, I will primarily be doing that. But if for some reason um, you guys pick up on that the turtle broke down and a, a different station is going to now be the turtle, you can basically choose a whatever resource happens to be out on the road. I'm just going to use this as a resource. Uh, let's see. Don't think I have any hams in here, but if we did, no, I don't believe there's any. Okay, there's a, there's a couple of people. Let's say 
we're on day one. We're going to go to the active day one course. They're obviously not anywhere near the course. But say, for example, if I believe this is Kirk, if Kirk was the um, turtle, you can click right click on his station, or click on his station and make him the active Houston turtle. So wherever he happens to be, he is now the turtle. And you can follow him wherever he happens to move. He will stay in the middle of your map. If I wanted to designate, I know there was a couple of APRS stations around here the other day. I don't see them anymore. But whoever the lead is, like say there's a station here that's the lead, you can make it active Houston lead. And then the, uh, the gray highlighter will uh, adjust. And if you wanted to follow the leader or follow the turtle, that's how all that works. And you also have your at medical and your awaiting SAG and all that and all the different statuses. So a lot more to this than meets the eye. And uh, once again, there's also a weather overlay and the different distances. And in the upper right-hand corner, you see NCS1. That's Kirk's, Kirk's designation from the, uh, he just went from one room in his house to another. So uh, that's why it just centered on him, but you can follow him. You can follow any of the motorcycle assets. A lot of these are from the Houston Marathon and other events in the system, but that's the idea. So you can make any resource be the turtle, any resource be the lead. You can follow any resource and uh, it, just play with it and enjoy it. There's a lot of stuff in there. And uh now I'm going to take probably about 8,000 questions or no questions at all. Crickets, crickets, isn't that nice? I'm kind of thinking that either, either I explained it really well or everybody left 20 minutes ago and I'm just talking to you and Steve. They all left 20 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, but leave it, talking about leaving, I've got to leave now. So I want to say a couple of quick things. Thank again. I want to thank everybody for volunteering for this. Um, Lee for, for being drafted and suckered into being the command post manager. Charlie, I always want to thank you for doing an instructions and volunteer registration and everything. Steve, John, taking care of all the, the equipment, the repeaters out there. And uh, Jeff, I want to appreciate you getting volunteers for all the uh, folks on the course. Jeff's already gone. He got tired. Oh, he has to go to work tomorrow, just like I do. And everybody else that's doing all this. So I really appreciate it. So it's really uh, helpful for, to make the event successful. And uh, again, uh, Leif, thanks for doing all this, putting it all together. I, Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. I believe Ron has a question about his hands at the CESC. So maybe if you could stick around to hear Ron's question, because I'm still not, I just came up with those times off the top of my head. I had no input. So maybe you can help out with that. Go ahead, Ron. Okay, thank you. I have received a call from one of my hams because initially I had asked the hams to be there at 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And they commented, because one of them's on the deal tonight, that uh, the shift is from 6 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. Need clarification. Well, once again, that was something that I came up with based on how we run events at uh, Transtar. Anything having to do with Harris County, uh, Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, we run 12-hour periods. Um, I'm trying to keep them less than 12 hours because we don't really have a three-shift system. I can't do triple eights. So I, I kind of adjusted it to 12-12. Um, it can be fluid. We can obviously, if somebody needs to get a little rest, we can always call in one of the night people early. If somebody's willing to stay a little bit later, so somebody, one of the night person can come in later, uh, welcome to do that. But until we know exactly how many people are going to be around, uh, the day tour is basically going to be there for 14 hours. Um, so we're going to need at least six to eight hours of rest assuming nothing happens, in which case it's going to be all hands on deck. Um, I think, I think Lee, once we get moving and everything, we'll see how things flow. 
So Ron will have other people coming in. Some people may not show up till 10. Um, and then they could work till six, they can fill in the gaps. So even though Lee may said 14, it may not be 14, it may be eight or 10. So just, I hate to put it this way, just go with the flow on the times right now. We have to see, like you said, who's gonna come in when and what time. We may have other volunteers. We still have volunteers on the list uh, that haven't been assigned. Uh, you may have some other volunteers that want to step up, Ron, and we can fill in the gaps that way. We can always use extra people to answer phones, relieve people on the radios, fill in for a couple of hours to get the relief people in. Uh, as I said earlier, I will have my P25 on at all times. So if uh, something needs to be handled on the road, I'll be, I'll be scanning and listening to all four. Uh, I'll be listening to the med net and the sag net and the tactical net until I go to bed, in which case I'll be listening to the tactical net. So if something happens, we can always handle it um, from wherever we happen to be, whether it's at the hotel or we go to dinner or whatever. Uh, we can try to take some of the stress off of you guys by handling requests that come in over the Trump network other than medical. Um, we'll also have, um, I would assume our ham radios at some point, uh, whatever we're able to reach, if there's a local node that we can monitor for people calling in. If we need to handle something that we're not in the CEOC, we'll be able to help you guys out with that. But once again, it really depends on how many people we get uh, from your location. I pretty much have uh, um, shot my wad as far as what we've got coming from down here. I don't believe, and, and once again, there's a couple of people that signed up that I haven't even heard from, that I haven't played phone tag with yet, and we may not be getting them. Um, so hey Ron, uh, one thing, Ron, you, you have two hams overnight on Friday. Uh, that's going to be like a Maytag repairman. Uh, there's probably going to be practically zero going on on Friday night. Saturday to Sunday would be a different thing, but it's still it's pretty dead. In the past, the overnight shifts for the Houston command post, we had one person uh, staffing it. And he might answer a half dozen calls. Um, he came in about 10 and stayed at about six. So that gives you an idea. But then, then again, that's folks in Houston. And we had lots of people coming in, going in and out. They'd work three or four hours and leave. Right. And we have a half dozen groups like that. So yeah, being up in Brian, we don't have those resources available to us. However, if, if some of the people want to, they're, they're more than welcome to work the day shift for a number of hours, and then they can go to one of the beds in the facility and coop for a few hours and then come back and spend a couple few extra hours at night uh, until midnight or whatever, and then go back to their hotel if they have one, sleep over and then come in a little bit later on the next day. I mean, we can we can always work that out on the fly. I just want to make sure that there's always somebody that can that that's bright enough and resourceful enough to handle anything that comes in, or if they can't, at least know how to contact the people that can. Okay, that, I was just trying to verify initially when it was said 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, so what I'm hearing now is, uh, if need be, they could come in at 6 p.m. and and go to say 5 a.m. If, if they're willing to do that, yes. Uh, if you have two people that are willing to split six and six, if somebody wants to come in at, uh, at midnight and take a six hour shift, that's fine. Uh, I will leave it up to your, your, your people and you. If you can schedule people that way, if it's more convenient for your people, if they don't wanna do 12s or uh, you know 10 by 10s or whatever, um, you, you know a lot more about your people and what their capabilities and what their willingness an ability to do and what the, what their availability is than I do. Okay. Well, this is all new to us up here. It's we have handled things many years ago with lines back ride and other things, one day events. So uh, we have not had any experience to the level that you have talked about this evening. So we're willing to be trained and uh, help out wherever we can. And, uh, I will uh, talk with the individuals that's volunteered for uh, 
Friday and Saturday night and try to pull some others in, but uh, uh, we'll definitely work on that. Well, I can I can always adjust our battle rhythm, if you will, um, and we can do four hour shifts. Even if you've got guys that want side offs for doing a four hour Oxcom shift or a four hour radio shift, I don't know if you guys are actually doing radios up there, but if you if you've got people working on their task books for uh, Oxcom and they want to do a four hour shift and then swap with somebody else that wants a four hour shift, we can adjust that on the fly. Um, once again, this is the first time that we've done this uh, using Brian as the EOC. Back in Houston, as Mike said, we had uh, a lot. We've got like 600 people down here in Aries between the four parts of Houston and Harris County. So we can only bring so many people that are willing to leave their, uh, their, their area and stay in a hotel room for, for two or three nights. So um, anything that, you, that your people can help us with will be immensely, immensely helpful and we will take care of everything on the fly and we will get it done. Worst case scenario, Mike Hardwick doesn't like to sleep very much, so he can just stay in the command center for 52 hours and then uh, every, everything will be taken care of. Hey, hey Ron, you all yes. have, have people in the street corner uh, collecting money and trying to wash your windshields? Well, we might have to put out some uh, buckets and do that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, if you have some street people you want to get rid of, Bring them over to the command post. We'll train them, and they'll operate the radios that night or something. <laughs> Straight people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then, but let, me, then, let me work on some more people here. I've got four right now, and uh, uh, we were initially talking about 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, one of them has agreed to that they would actually work. This is Friday night. Kevin is probably still online. Uh, and he agreed to work as long as he needs to on, on Friday. Ron, let's talk about this tomorrow, okay? Yes, sir. We sure can. All right. Outstanding. And once again, and thanks thanks to all you guys up north um, for, for, for helping out here. I'm sorry we, we took so long to get with you guys. Like I said, it's just been an insane um, period of time here. Um, Josh, real quick, uh, just check your chat. I sent you your credentials to get into the mapping system. Play with it. Try to break it. Everybody else, try to break it. Uh, we won't know what the, the points of failure are until they actually occur. It's pretty robust. Boston Marathon couldn't break it. So um, I'm kind of hoping that nobody here in uh, this area can, but Texas, we do things differently. So uh, Amina and the rest of you guys try to break it, uh, you know, by do, doing everything that you can to make the system fail. And if it does crash, we want to know what the points of failure are. Uh, everybody else here, Charlie, uh, of course, I'll get with you. I'm going to give you full access to everything. And, um, you know, as we go along, we'll give you credentials uh, as, as needed. Everybody in the command post, you'll all get that on uh, Friday afternoon for your laptops and stuff. I just don't want to put it out too early uh, in case we decide to change it. Um, there's, uh, there's something else going on with the data. Uh, that's going on with this that I'm not going to get into, but we need to make sure that only the people that need to get the data uh, authorized to see it are able to use it. Um, we've had some connections to the database from a source that we're not quite sure where it's coming from, but it's in California, and we may need to actually block that at some point and change some passwords. So, Lee, uh, thanks again for everything, and I want to thank everybody else. I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. Mike, one quick question. I know you don't like me asking me this because I've asked you this every day for the past 30 days. Uh, the ham uh, frequency so I can do the start doing code plugs in the 205. We're going to be talking tomorrow about that. Okay. That's what I set tomorrow aside for. Tomorrow's Friday, right? Friday. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take, let's take questions from everybody else. I know my, uh, my crack team of operators here, uh, Mr. John, uh, I hope I've addressed your concerns. You, you brought up a lot of very, very good points about the coverage maps uh, between Keith. I don't know why Keith Limple wasn't here tonight. He said he was going to be here. I don't know what happened. Uh, he had another presentation, I think, to do. Oh, uh, did he? Okay, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you, John, and, uh, and Steve and, and, and Keith all know each other. And... Um, uh, Keith is a networking genius. 
Uh, he's been doing this stuff forever like you guys have. So uh, if you guys could all work together and uh, I'm sure that we'll be able to get everything fixed if anything breaks. Um, we're all relying on you for your expertise because Lord knows I have no idea what's going on with Lincoln. Uh, so Lee, dur Lee, during the day shift, we w will we have a uh, all-star node link expert in the command post? Well, Keith is supposed to be there. Um, if the other two gentlemen, uh, John and Steve, uh, and him are all on the same page as far as privileges to change settings, I don't. Like I said, I don't really know how that all works. Um, I'm assuming that there will always be somebody there, or at least immediately reachable to deal with any technical okay, That's good. And and Steve minimum. is nodding his head, and I believe John is nodding his head, so good. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. at a minimum, somebody, we can just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, this is squirrely. Um, you know, can you figure out which repeater it is and unlink it? You will have a visual that will show you when they key up which one it is. That's oh, okay, you'll be able to put that all-star map on the uh, one of our screens. Yeah, she will, there will be a URL uh, and it will show you when they're talking, it will light up and, and show you which one. Excellent. Perfect. It was, we were supposed to have that last year, but I don't believe we ever did. Right. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. I talked over you. I said, and per net, you'll have, uh, you'll be able to see it both nets on Saturday or individual nets if you wanted to break it down to that status. Outstanding. All and right. I have a, 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 I, who is the guy's name that starts with L that will be at Brian tomorrow? Leslie Lutz. Leslie. One of those RJ connectors for internet on that wall was dead last year. And well, I'll be talking like to nobody, about, yeah, I'll uh -huh. be about all that. Okay. They need to test those and make sure they're live and they have an IP or whatever. So, well, as Talking earlier about internet connections in the radio room. Yes. Um, Lee mentioned six. I moved it to eight. Okay. Six for computers and two for All Star. Okay. And I would prefer my stuff plug in on an RJ connector, not Wi Fi. Yes. Well, I, I know. Well, okay. we, we can, like I said, we, I know Keith carries around uh, several hubs, or okay. one of you guys can bring a hub. We could just take one Ethernet cable and branch out everything. Um, if one of you guys or two of you guys or whoever's going to be up there wants to bring cables and RJ 45s, or I can bring a thousand feet and a bunch of pass throughs and I can throw together cables on the fly on Friday. I'm sure between the four of us, we can get the stuff done. I also know that Josh is also an IT guy. Um, although he's way above my level at this point with his company, I'm sure he still remembers how to do a cat five cable. So between all of us, uh, all of us, I'm sure, will be able to get the networking done. Just to let you know, Lee, we have a huge case, a plastic case, uh, that used was used to wire up the Houston command post. That's still available, I hope. Okay, I didn't see that. If I can get that, it, it could wire up the radio room in Bryan. So we'll go from there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead, like I said, jump out of here. Uh, if anybody has any questions for me, send them to Lee get them to, or send them to me. I don't care. Uh, I can lie about anything. I am from this. I do work with the state. So anyhow, y'all have a good night. You too. Thanks, Mike. All right. Uh, I'm going to send Kevin some credentials here. Well, while you're doing that, I got a question for the all-star guys. So do we have, uh, are we going to have in the command post, uh, uh, non-radio all-star boxes? Are we going to have radio with nodes? It will be two boxes with microphones and an internet connection on the back and a speaker jack. Okay, and what size will the speaker jack be? Mini uh, mono. Mini mono, okay. Yeah. And three, you guys will be, able, uh, you'll be able to adjust the attenuation on the fly if there's like really low output or really there's, high there's the same volume knob that was on them last year. I think the problem last year was someone was trying to plug a stereo headset in and it was shorting out on the mono jack inside. I have now in my possession two stereo to mono adapters in case that we need those for this year. So as I as I call them ditties. Yes. Uh, what, what size did you say the adapter was? So you, uh, somebody was talking over you. Five millimeter. Three point five. 
Yeah. Okay. What is that? One eighth. One eighth yeah. inch. I can get into. Yeah. Okay. Um, we haven't covered one very important person on this call. He's been kind of in the background, but uh, Charlie, Charlie Matthews, who's on his uh, iPhone, all masked up in uh, San Fran or thereabouts. For those of you that don't know who Charlie is, he's the guy that pulls all the volunteers together. So um, I just want to toss it over to him with my appreciation. Um, if he would like to say anything, uh, give any uh, suggestions or any questions he has or uh, anything to Charlie for putting in the, the ginormous amount of work that he does. He, he puts in months and hundreds of hours to pulling all these people together and then he winds up sitting in a box truck. So he, he participates too and he doesn't even live in Texas. So Charlie, if you're still there and you haven't fallen asleep or gotten bored, uh, anything you want to jump in and add? He's probably fast asleep or, or doing his job. He's, he, he, he bailed out a long time ago. But anyway, I just want to give props to Charlie because he puts in a lot of work for this as well. Um, and uh, Paul and, and Ron and all the rest of you guys from up north, thank you so much. I see we've even got, uh, even got Harry from St. Louis, Missouri, one of, my, uh, one of our, our Zoom channel friends here joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording, but we're going to keep, obviously this, uh, this channel is going to be continuing to be open. So let me just stop the recording.